Hi, everybody. I'm Diane Brady. I'm here with Jeff Maggioncalda, who is CEO of Coursera. Jeff, welcome. Nice to see you. Thank you. It's great to be here. I want to start with the big picture. You know, what is the future of colleges and universities? Because coming out of the pandemic, we've we've seen a rethinking of the physical infrastructure, and mm-hmm, you've got mm-hmm. 300 of them mm-hmm. on your platform. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. What do you think? Well, I think it starts with, you know, which region are we talking about? Because universities and the prospects they're facing in the United States is very different than India, which is mm-hmm. very different from Africa, which is also different from Latin America. Um, the partners that we have on our platform who are on the authoring side are about 200 of the top universities in the world in the U.S. Authoring and, meaning offering courses. That's right. They they're offering their, the right, courses. They're the brands we that you We have thousands yeah. of universities around the world that use those courses and are integrating those courses into the curriculum that they deliver right. to, their ki- to their students. So, so I think that um, a few major things. Number one is the need for education has never been higher because the world's changing and people need to learn new skills. The rewards to people who have those skills are greater than ever. You can see the difference between someone who graduates with a degree in computer science versus one who graduates with a degree like I did in English. Right. Um, But I think what's, what's really been exciting is the possibility that people can get access to high quality education far more affordably in a far more flexible way from anywhere in the world. We saw that during the pandemic. And for people who are able to develop skills that are valuable and that employers are looking for, the ability to turn that kind of knowledge and skills and those college credentials into job opportunities on the other side of the world is that, something we never saw before. That's true. That's the post, that is the vision and that's obviously um, the value proposition that you offer. Yeah. There is that middle tier mm-hmm. of physical infrastructure, the ones that are not necessarily um, bringing those best in class lessons. What what do you see happening to them? Just and again, it's, I don't mm-hmm, want to mm-hmm. keep it just anchored in that, but yep. there are a lot of choices people have to make now. And you mentioned credentials, micro credentialing yep. is as much a theme as getting a full degree. Do you see a role for those institutions or a continued struggle? I do. I think there's a difference though between the institution and the building that they inhabit. Okay. Uh, what we have seen post pandemic is the demand for residential undergraduate programs that are at the top tier has never been higher. Right. I mean, that's what pe- that's what young adults want is to get into that selective university, go live on campus with their friends, have fun, meet professors, watch the football games. Like that's an experience. It's it's a bundled experience that includes all sorts of things like mm-hmm. getting, you know, a degree and learning things and having fun and making friends and seeing other viewpoints. If you're a school that and so I, what it comes back to is who is your customer? Yep. If you're a school that serves working adults who don't really want to come for the residential experience, they really just need to advance in their career or switch careers. And actually physically being in a place is a liability, not a benefit. Then I would say try to start winding down that space and move more of your curriculum online and then collaborate. You certainly, it would be great if you did it with Coursera, but we just facilitate the ability for a university or a business or a government to collaborate with the Stanfords of the world and the Pens of the world and the Microsofts of the world and the Googles of the world who have created online courses that maybe are subjects that you don't currently offer to your students. They're available now and, and pretty much turnkey. So adapt or die is, so why, is kind yeah, of, I think, the answer. We can all have, and that's always been the, the promise, you can all have access to that Ivy League education, which yeah. you've had, which yeah. I know English or not. Yeah. What is the challenge in terms of profitability? You're a market leader um, in terms of the brand, the recognition, the partnerships, but yet it is a space still where people struggle to make money. What What is the challenge there right now um, on a macro level? I think it's a it's a fair question that certainly Coursera being in this space, we need to be thinking about it. But even before we arrived in the ed tech sector, the ed tech sector could be a tough place. I think there is one issue, which is predictability, mm-hmm. which is how reliably can you sell a product to a customer who has a budget to buy it? Unit economics, which is how much does it cost to deliver it? How much did it cost to create it? Which is not so much the unit economics, but that's the fixed cost of it. But then there's differentiation. If you're selling into a market with a lot of friction, you don't have a really clear buyer that's going to persist and want to buy your product. And as soon as you find something that works, someone could come and copy you for cheaper. 
that's a tough market to be in. So I do think that finding a real problem to be solved, having a solution that's unique, and then also protectable. Well, bring Different. it, like, bring that's it a back big part to, of to, to yourself as CEO. Mm-hmm. I know that you've had a presentation to investors uh, recently. Um, from where you sit and, and the strategy for the company and mm-hmm. what you're doing, you've talked about long-term profitability. Yeah. It is a cluttered space. I mean, where do you see the differentiation for you? Because it's certainly a name I've known of, you know, yeah. on the consumer side, yeah. with people in this office who've yeah. used it. I think there's a, a few. I mean, obviously, when you think about education technology, there there's a lot of different, you know, facets of that. There are some people who compete with YouTube and go directly to individuals with just how-to content. Very difficult space. Right. You're not in the influencer space. Right. We are not in yeah. the influencer space. Unless you would call some of the professors. or I mean, right. they do have big followings. Um but that's hard to build a business in such a crowded, undifferentiated market. There are some players who have been in the degrees only space, and that has been generally a very high cost type of production capability and very high acquisition cost marketing right. capability. So that's been struggling. As I think about Coursera and what we need to do and what we're, I think, pretty well set up to do is to be a global brand. Mm-hmm. where we can have global distribution because it, it costs a lot of money to build the architecture. It costs a lot of money to bring on these partners. Yeah, if you they don't come cheap. They don't come cheap. And if, if you can't spread that across lots and lots and lots and lots of learners around the world, then you're not going to make enough revenue to pay for the cost of building this thing in the first place. In addition, when you think about the content that you want to bring on, if it's something that you can get anywhere or doesn't have a credential that has some kind of value it's really hard to differentiate. So we we think a lot about what is the quality and the brand, not just of Coursera, but of our partners. Mm-hmm. Um, and does the content have a credential that goes with it? Whether that's a college degree that says, I know this because I, I passed my tests and I got this college degree, or I know this because um, a Meta gives me a certificate that says I have passed all which, the programs. Which you're now offering for free from Meta, right? So, like so that though those skills demands you can offer free. It it's interesting um, when this sort of first came out. It was very much about the consumer, the individual. Yes, yes. Like Diane, you want to improve, go to Coursera and you know make yourself nimbler, faster, stronger. Now it seems there's more on the enterprise, and it's the company that that's really like it's the company's responsibility to now serve me up this what are you seeing in terms of the division of growth on your end it's a combination so, so the, the 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 consumer channel which is that direct to individuals is definitely how the company got started right. i think if we tried to start going through institutions for, it would have been dead before it ever took off right going straight to individuals was kind of the big game changer back in 2012 and then what we have done is said look we'll continue to serve individuals directly like totally friction free just coming learn what you want but there are a lot of individuals people at work who want the support of their company saying, I, if you want this job, here are the skills that you need. We will help you get access to the content on Coursera. We'll help measure that. We'll provide support for you. We'll pay for it for you. So helping people through institutions, which are businesses is important. Students on campus who are today taking a bunch of courses on campus, but would like to take some courses on Coursera that count towards a degree. That's an institutional uh, mm-hmm. sort of support structure that's very helpful. And then in governments, we're working with lots of governments who are helping unemployed and underemployed citizens who might not know to go to Coursera or might not know which jobs to 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 to, uh, to pursue or might not have the money to pay for it. So working through institutions to serve individuals is, I'd say, an, an addition to going directly to the individuals. You know, you get, you get a lot of insight in what's happening on the global front, students, and, so, mm-hmm. and obviously... Um, I've seen a little bit about the demographics, you know, the popularity in places like China and India. What are you seeing in terms of trends that that are interesting or surprising to you in terms of both demand and maybe um, some of the different areas? I'm makes sense, you know, yeah. generative AI. We want to all learn about it, but anything else that's on your radar that's just emerging? The 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 things that we've seen for quite some time is that if you look, because because we have 5,500 courses from yep. our partners that are published, and most of them are in business technology and data science. We have a growing number in healthcare. We also have them in social sciences, history, culture, all sorts of things. We don't get almost any revenue for anything other than business technology, data science, and health. The other stuff is just for enjoyment, and people don't really pay for that. They they just take it. Self edification. That's is right. Not profitable. And we we like to say skills pay the bills. Right. For okay. us and for the learners. I mean, learning a skill that's going to help your career. That's what people pay for. So, 
when we that's been a trend that's been around for, for, for a longer period of time. I'd say that, you know, more recently, what we have seen is a lot of younger people realizing that English is a second language is a valuable way to get a remote job at an international company. Mm. Generally speaking, what we've heard, what we've seen people realize is, hey, not only can I learn from anywhere, but certain skills will enable me to get a remote work job. Yeah. And so my job opportunities are much broader than the city that I'm living in or the country that I'm That's in. That's one of those skills pay the bills. That's not a self-edification. It, 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 exactly. And um, I would be remiss not to ask about generative AI yeah. since we now have chat GPT you know, passing Wharton MBA exams. Mm -hmm. How is that impacting your business? So far, we don't think it's shown up yet. Um, but here's how I think it's going to impact yep. the business. I think on the learner side, it's going to be an incredible learning experience. Um, the idea that back in the day with YouTube, it was sort of what I call passive learning. You watch a video. I mean, you just sit there and watch a video. I mean, you could learn something. But when Coursera launched in 2020, 2012 uh, by two professors, they said, we want to have active learning, which is you watch a video, but then you answer questions. You reflect on that. Yeah. You build a project. You give a peer review and discuss it in a forum. I think that what ChatGPT is going to do on the learner side is bring in a level of personalized learning and interactive. So it's not just active learning, it's interactive learning where I'll watch a video. It'll say, relate this to your personal life and then explain why you know it might be relevant for your career. You say, this is why I think, and then it'll give you feedback. Well, did you think about this? Or if that's what you think, go check out this course. So the idea to, of almost having a personal tutor with you all the time helping clarify things that you're learning, giving examples of things, helping you see other resources if you're struggling, even understanding how what you're learning might be relevant to a certain career, I think is going to be marvelous. That's the plus. Yes. What about the peril? Like, so let's say, for example, I've got a Coursera and and it's it's the um, the program is mm -hmm. basically going, doing it for me. And so I'm in essence getting a credential through a program that I didn't earn myself. Yeah, so I, I do think that some people call it academic integrity. Right. Which is clearly something all the universities are worrying about. And it's harder in, an, in a remote environment, especially when it's overseas and it's not like you have a camera trained on the person doing the program. Yeah, so there's definitely interest in how do you assess people? And, and part of it is how do you make sure they're not cheating? But part of it too is what are the skills that we want to be assessing? I, as an English major, I think it's important to be able to write because for me, and I think most, the act of writing includes the act of thinking. When I'm trying to put together two thoughts to write it, I'm actually also trying to connect ideas in yeah. my own mind. And if yeah. I just outsource that to ChatGPT, I'm not connecting dots in my in my brain. At the same tone, though, a lot of businesses are saying, hey, I hope that the, the universities teach people how to use this because this is a thinking tool that we want our employees to be using. I mean, it's a great equalizer in a way. If you're over in in place like Poland, English isn't your first language. Absolutely. You can now communicate your ideas with the same ease as you or I. And I, so this English is, I'll go back to the peril, but, but you're totally right. I mean, well, I think that you're right. We'll see how it turns out. But I think very often, and you can understand why, people often equate the quality of your thinking with the quality of your writing. But if all the yeah. writing was high quality and suddenly I could have GPT express my creative ideas or my good ideas, even though I might not be expert at the language, kind of all ideas have a more equal chance yeah. to be heard without bias. We do over index on verbal intelligence, don't we, relative yeah, to I, other ones? That's why I'm an English writer. No, well, I, I, think, I think that's right. And so I think that the what we assess and how we assess is going to have to change. I think where we might be heading, although it's 800 years old, the tutorial method in Cambridge and Oxford where you have an interactive discussion with Go your, back further, the Socratic method, yeah, go, right? Yeah, go back to the Socratic method. This is a pretty valuable way to not only show what you know, but also develop how you think. And there how might be a How do you scale for, that? Like well, that's the challenge for you because you are your model's based on scaling yeah. something that was inaccessible. Right. I too can have access to a Stanford well, class. Re remember what I, w w the way we started. I think that what this technology is going to do is take us from active learning to interactive learning. So interactive learning can not only necessarily be teaching me things, it can be the way I get quizzed. Right. Maybe I actually have a tutorial session with ChatGPT. Where and a webcam. Yeah, and it's, <laughs> and it's like, okay, here you go. And so it's like, how do I think about this? And how do I respond to novel questions or blind, sort of where are my blind spots? 
I think that could be a pretty effective way. It's, it served Cambridge and Oxford really well. It has a lot of pedagogical evidence that that's a really effective instructional technique, but it's very, it has historically been very expensive to scale. It might be possible to scale that. So let me talk about expense for a second, mm -hmm. because um, I know that uh, I certainly think about this with my kids. I grew up in Canada where I, I actually made money going to university, mm -hmm. as one can do up there. Less so now, but um, we're in a week, a period right now, we're talking about student loans, mm -hmm. the level mm -hmm. of debt, which really mm -hmm. is especially onerous in the U.S. Mm -hmm. for American right. students. Um, you are one of the potential ways to ameliorate that, right? It's a, it's a lower cost when you do things through Coursera. Yeah. What do you see as the end game here? I mean, you've mentioned we'll continue to pay for those elite experiences, yeah. but um, is it sustainable? I mean, when you think about what's happening in the loan environment, sounds like a leading question. It's mm -hmm. not meant to. Mm -hmm. Genuinely curious if you're seeing that we're subbing in what you do for what we used to pay a lot of money for. Well, I, I think it's going to go hybrid. I, I think that just as we work in a hybrid way, sometimes in offices, sometimes at home, I think they'll be on campus and off campus. Many people will be only online. But part of hybrid, too, is the hybridization between universities and industry. So we just talked today. Shared costs? Well, n not necessarily sharing costs, but more sharing content. Mm. So we announced, not announced, but we shared today um, some really exciting results that we're seeing from Colorado University Boulder. Mm -hmm. They have a master's degree in data science. It's fully online on Coursera. But what they've done is they've said, you can start this degree program by taking open courses on Coursera for $49 a month. Anytime you want, go ahead and start. Now, you, you don't start in the degree program, but you start by taking courses that if you want to get into the degree program, they will count as credit. Like prep school. It's like prep, but it counts. And your, your admissions into the program is based on your performance in these courses. So there's no admissions process. It's much more affordable. And they are also integrating IBM content in. So it's not only coming from professors. It's now, also does IBM promise you a job the way they do at P Tech or something? Because mm. that, that's from the high school model. Yeah, right? no, yeah. I think job promises, no, no, but job preparedness, yes. So, so I think that what's going to happen is the costs are going to come way down because more of the learning is going to happen in these scaled kinds of environments. The cost of production is going to be lower. The facilities, which cost a lot of money, are going to be downsized. Mm -hmm. And more learners will utilize property, plant, equipment, and faculty less than they have historically. Well, you know, I'm fascinated because you know, as a CEO, as somebody who's in the ed, ed tech education space, you're, we do feel like we're on the cusp of a seismic change mm -hmm. right now. And that's the way people are certainly thinking about not just generative AI, but education has sort of been one of the last frontiers to really have a digital transformation in a yeah. meaningful sense. What? Do you, how do you see this playing out? Because when I speak to other CEOs, they do talk about the displacement of jobs. You know, mm -hmm. you've got your own people internally, professors, etc. Do you see it being as profound a shift as um, certainly some of the headlines would suggest, or do you see it as a steady path? I think it's going to be pretty profound. And, and and what's your timeline looking like? And how do you react when you saw ChatGPT? How did it change your mindset around what you do? It's interesting. I, I, I know people who are software engineers, and the first time they saw ChatGPT, they said, this is just autocomplete. They were thinking about the technology. And indeed, that's kind of what it does. It predicts is what's to which tokens come next. Those tokens often be Sounds like word people phrases. who don't recognize an industry shift that could disrupt well, yeah, them. Yeah, me as an English major, I said, it's writing really high quality, coherent passages. Doesn't I, do limericks well, I'll tell you that. Yeah, but yes, it's, that's yeah, the it's next working one. on them. So, so for me, I think it's a very big deal. I don't think it's going to necessarily d displace all the jobs, but any any job that is associated with the generation or manipulation of text, audio, images, and video, which media, any media related job, not necessarily going to be disappearing. It's going to be fundamentally changed by these tools. And there's a lot of jobs in media. So, so I, and that also includes, you know, in, instruction. And there's a lot of jobs in education. So I think it will have a big effect. I don't know exactly how, don't know exactly when. But I do know that adaptation and change is going to be required among all parties. I mean, among the students, among the faculty, among the institutions and the trustees. The employers are the fastest to change usually. And then the, 
The, the profit the, incentive the, that's, helps. That's right. And they have the money to do it. Then they look for the employees. The employees then look for the skilling. And then the institutions need to skill them. But I think that u- universities and educational institutions who can understand the needs of employers and understand the needs of students and how they're changing and then adapt the way that they provide for those needs are going to be the ones that flourish. And there was, I just showed today, there was a, a survey from Hull and IQ in 2022. They asked universities globally, what are the biggest challenges you're facing? Number one was dealing with the di- digital adoption. So universities know the challenges here. Dealing themselves with digital adoption as That's opposed right. to democratizing. Um, yeah. I want to ask about the culture wars. How's that playing out for you? Since we've seen critical race theory, yeah. woke, I mean, I just, it's head spinning, and yet yeah, it's yeah. playing out certainly on campuses. You know, we we have, um, I think, as part of the skills pay the bills. <laughs> There's not. You a feel whole, like you're you you're. I, I guess what I would say is I've just seen virtually zero evidence of anyone having any issue. They're like, look, I want to learn how to do the skill to, to do. So a you job. doesn't so play out that much. It just much. doesn't show up on our radar screen. I think partly because what learners are looking for are those courses that usually have nothing to do with the culture wars. They're like, hey, I, I need to learn these skills to do a better job. And everybody wants that, whether you're on one part of the political spectrum or another one. Is there anything else that, uh, you know, I know you ta- you've talked about sort of where your own growth will come from, but, you know, from where you're, you're sitting, especially, let's say, advice to uh, young people who are coming mm-hmm. up looking, contemplating, you know, that sort of plastics benjamin plastics kind of advice you might yeah, give yeah yeah what would what would you say <laughs> i would say that the future will be more uncertain than it's ever been for any previous generation they thanks know, like, very yeah, much for thanks, that yeah. thanks dad right but um in terms of jobs really hard to predict i would suggest that um learning agility is probably the most important thing that's what we learning, know. Learning. How sure. does one learn agility? Like agile is its own. So, yeah, you know, I would but, say learning agility, which is basically what is your receptivity and capacity to learn new things. And if once you do that, then try to pay attention to what you need to be learning, and hopefully you'll be kind of curious to go do that. I, I do think people have to kind of go where their passions are because if you're not enjoying it, it's going to be hard to keep up with the rate of things that you need to learn. So doing something that you enjoy and that makes you happy. Oh, another thing too, by the way, emotional and mental health is super important. Think of how difficult it is to cope when you're not sleeping well, you don't feel loved and supported, you're not exercising, you're just full of stress. Taking care of your emotional and physical health, which to me largely is sleep well, eat, and be with people who love you. Stay so, off of all the hater sites and stay with people that you respect and who love you, because that's going to be how you keep energized to go through this learning process right. and, and do the best job. But it doesn't actually it does not impact um, the nature of what you're offering, is it? Are you do it finding yourself? Doing more content around that sort of wellness, we, mental yeah. There, health, there's a lot of interest in that. Now we often don't get paid. I mean, they, they take those that's, courses for free, but that's fine. I think that's like that's a your philanthropic great, side. Absolutely, Dr. Lori Santos at Yale. The number one course on Yale is called they call it the Happiness Course on Yale. She put the course on Coursera. We call it the Science of Wellbeing. It's like five million people have taken this course, and I do think that that physical and emotional and mental health is the fuel that people are going to need to do all this learning and change and just staying on your toes. And and so I would say, take good care of yourself and surround yourself with people who love you, find things that you're interested in and be ready to keep learning. I'll say one other thing about uh-huh. leadership. A lot of, and I understand this, but a lot of the um, people earlier in their career at Coursera and other places, they'll often say, tell me what I need to do to get promoted. That's fair when you're just starting in your career. But just like if you want to do really well on a sports team or do well, really well, you know, in school, you don't just ask the coach, like, tell me exactly what I you need to do. You don't crowdsource excellence. Well, you, you don't. And you also don't ask someone to tell you exactly how to be excellent. Part of leadership is charting a path that doesn't really exist in any clear way. And so I'd say young people who can say, I will develop my own point of view I will be willing to take a risk and go someplace without someone someone telling me this is what you do to get promoted or this is what you do to like, I don't know what I need to do. I'm going to just go there. The value, I think, of leadership is going to be higher and higher and higher because the uncertainty is higher 
and change is going to be more frequent. And so who will be the leaders that can say, without someone telling me where to go, this is where we're going to go and we're going to find our way and we'll yep. be together. Emotional intelligence yes. can't always get it online, but uh, it helps. Yep. So thanks for joining us. Absolutely. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.